uh, guest slot live since last year. It's taken me a bit of a while to get my momentum going back on these, but I am so delighted that today I have with me the amazing Marcus Ahmad of Marcus Ahmad Photography, who I met through networking. And thank you, Marcus, for actually approaching me and suggesting this topic for today's live. So let me tell you a little bit about Marcus. He is a branding photographer and focuses on personal and business branding, doing headshots and also offering tuition to both uh, single people on, you know, one-to-one -one coaching, but also groups, I believe as well. And you have an amazing blog. I took a look the other day and you've got so many wonderful tips and hints and things to read for anybody who wants to get into a bit of photography. So really recommend taking a look at that. And I love your kind of tagline on your website where you say that you offer aspirational photography for inspirational people. And I think that just encapsulates beautifully uh, looking at your photographs, that's really what they do. They show people as being very inspirational. But not only all of that, Marcus is also a senior lecturer at the University of South Wales. So really, you know your stuff and you have lots of experience, don't you? Because I was reading about how you've worked globally and you your background is in both advertising and fashion photography. So quite a resume that you've got going there. But as I said, Marcus approached me to offer the talk that he's going to be doing today. So I think without further ado, I will hand over to you, Marcus, if you'd like to get your slides ready and we can have a look at some of your beautiful work. Oh, you're very kind, Robin. Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for a really kind intro. I hope I can live up to the expectations. No problem at all, I'm sure. And also, I've got to say, it's great to be in a show with a fellow scarf and scarf wearer. Like, where would we be without these little bits of cloth around our neck, eh? <laughs> Absolutely, I need it. Okay, let's get this PowerPoint up here. Let's see if this was working. How's that? Can you see that okay, Robin? I can see it. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, okay, so um, we're going to look at just a few photographers. I've chosen about half a dozen photographers who, who aren't particularly well known, um, who work um, in a very sort of contemplative uh, manner. They, they're almost using their camera as a means uh, to create cathartic photography. And that's why I've come up with this title. It's a bit of a play, you know, it doesn't really mean too much, but it's about the idea of how, you, how a photographer can see things um, or approach things in a way that maybe non-photographers not, might not see it, see it, if that makes sense. So we're going to dive straight in here, um, and we're going to look at Ralph Eugene uh, Meatyard. Let me just move this slide out. This, can I just move that out of the way? No. Okay, we leave that there. So Ralph Eugene Meatyard, and what a fantastic name that is for a start. Um, Ralph Eugene Meatyard is an American photographer. Um, he was he, he was born in 1925 and died in 1972. And he documented the town where he lived in. And the, the town was a place called uh, Normal. Get that normal in <laughs> Illinois. I know. And these photographs are nothing <laughs> and there's nothing normal about them. So let's dive straight in here and have a look at some of the Okay, is that working there? We'll go to that one. Right, we're going to start Ooh. off with this. So he, he, he was not really known uh, when he was alive. Sadly, he only became to prominence in the really in the 1990s when his work was discovered hidden away in his attic. Wow. About 8,000 black and white prints were discovered. Uh, and the, the Museum of Modern Art, I think it was, they put a, a display on, and now he's become to prominence, or uh, in the photographic world at least. He was an optician, which is quite interesting, because mm. you, you work does play on light, optics, etc. So mm. this is a, a, a body of work he created called the Family Album. So he created this mythical family um, um, using 
people on, in the village of Normal, uh, his relatives as well. And he used masks, as we can see, dolls, and creating a very surreal outlook. Um, he was definitely influenced by people like Picasso, I would say. Mm. And the, yeah, the surrealist, and certainly at that time, the abstract uh, expressionist movement in America. Um, and you can see that there's, there's something definitely odd about these photographs. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. And it's we're not here to delve into his mind. I've got. I'm not. Saying, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But um, certainly, there was some kind of um, emotion here. He was trying to get out. Mm. We got real people. We got dolls. We got body parts. Well, plastic body parts. Mm. Um, skulls in the corner all in black and white and all filmed on this this little twin lens camera they had with a which is like two lenses you look down on it and it's um a square black and white format um so yeah so he's got these people wearing these masks in these rather strange poses and it's and it's his family his family album This is uh, this one. Um, I think is an interesting one, especially going back to the fact that he was an optician, because he's got the, the the figure on the mask on the right hand side of the image, nicely framed there, you know, mm. in that diagonal line. Yes, uh, and but on the left hand side, we've got the child who's moving really quickly, mm. and it is creating a blur. So we've got sort of two techniques here of creating a mask. We've got the actual mm. mask. Yeah, and on the left-hand side, we've got the mask created by the, the magical photography playing around with the shutter speed, the blur, the motion blur. So mm. I think it's quite a nice dichotomy between those two figures. But yeah, I think, I, you know, this they're, they're, a little, they're, they're strange, but they're not, and they're, they're difficult to understand, but they're not, there's, there's humour in there, Robin, do, do you not think? I think absolutely, particularly you notice it in that one. And I think yeah. there's something slightly unsettling with the the black and white aspect of it and the um, the mask wearing, but it's that thing that kind of makes you feel, ooh, what 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 on earth is he trying to achieve here? It makes you ask those questions. It makes you look within. Yes, I mean he was not seeking fame, as I said, during his lifetime, no. he was he was unknown. He hid his work away, and he just worked within his village, you know, in his town, a small town, no doubt. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, you're right. Exactly. There was some definitely this cathartic process was going on, you know, it, within his mind. There was some expression he was trying to get out there. Um, a couple more, I think I've got in here. A little bit over the years, and you can see the different styles he was working with. That's, I think that, that is just fantastic. That one there. I it's love just, the hands. I know. I know. Where did he find those hands? I know. It looks great, doesn't it? It just looks really, 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 really odd. Okay. Um, on to Francesca Woodman. Uh, 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 again, an another American photographer with a, a very sad life. Uh, she had a very short life as well. Her family, her, her parents were artists, um, quite successful artists. Um, and she was, what, I've got my date here, 1958 she was born and she died in, 19, in 1981. She committed suicide wow. at the age of 22. Oh, yeah. So obviously a troubled soul. And we're going to see that clearly in these images mm -hmm. here. There is a bit of nudity in these, I should point out. Um, Francesca Woodman, yeah, I very popular amongst my photography students. It's, it's, can I hide can I hide that? Yes, thank you. Um, so self-portraits. Again, black and white. Again, similar to the other photographer, Ralphie G. Meat Yard, square format. Mm -hmm. That twin lens camera um, using natural light, but there's definitely a stronger narrative, I would say, going on here. Mm. Um, these, her family had a, 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 a home in Florence in Italy, uh, a summer home, and a lot of these were taken in that summer home. And as I said, you know, I'm not painting a bleak life here people uh, other artists would visit the home and they're well known in the community people like david hockney and richard sera who was the sculptor um but there's a darkness in here mm. hiding away mm. trying to 
even though that self-portrait is almost trying to hide herself within the frame, within the image. Very photographic, lot, very skillfully taken, beautiful constructions, a very minimum and beautifully framed as well. Uh, with, and it, 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 there's more questions being asked than mm. answered being given definitely i mean i don't know how this was made i don't know how this was constructed but there's certainly a strong narrative towards it again the idea about hiding away being enveloped by the wall almost becoming part of the wallpaper mm. there's another one another version of the same image mm -hmm. of the same set and i think this is even more um it's got a stronger image really beautifully minimal Again, coming harping back to that abstract expressionism feeling with the modernist feel to the wallpaper, the, the angles, but with this blurred figure, it, with a back to the camera, almost walking into the wall. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, I just suddenly come to me, it's got, do you know, is that Francis Bacon show on at the moment, isn't there? And I think it's at the Tate. I think it's at the Tate. The Francis Bacon show. Well worth checking out. I've heard some great reports. Um, uh, by it or read some great reports and francis bacon used this device as well in his painting of blurring blurring the surface mm. so yeah. it's distinct you know against this very formal background mm. a very static background and then the movement of the figure exactly robin exactly um okay look at this this is surrealism isn't this fantastic mm. this is a very young lady who's not studied photography but is definitely the word genius is often banded around, we know that, but there's definitely a hint of genius in here. Uh, they're just exquisitely comp composition, the exposure, the technical side of it, but the message is super strong. I mean, what is going on there? It's hard to see, isn't it? It's, hard to, it's, it's almost like it's in a paper bag. Yes. And is that yeah. a hand over the... It looks yeah. like a hand coming around a door. Exactly. Exactly. Superb. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I don't want to read too much. It's only my interpretation, but this definitely feels a womanhood on here and sexuality, um, you know, a, a, a definite fear of the world. Uh, yeah, Robin, you're going to say something, sorry? There, it looks like a snake in the bowl. There's a lot of stuff around energy in the Kundalini, you know. Oh, what's that? You, you explain that to me, please, Robin. Kundalini. The Kundalini is the energy and it's held at the base of the spine and it's often represented as a snake. And wow. because there's a double helix that goes up and down of energy, that <sighs> the snake it goes up and down across, through that energy. So wow. just thinking of the placement of the bowl and it's kind of like it's the energy externalized because obviously it's not in her body. But it's, yeah, there's so much symbolism, isn't there, within... Yes. Within that's her, a very interesting take on it, Robin. Very interesting your point of view. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. This energy, and you say the helix. That's a sort of helix mm. shape there, isn't it? Going on with the exactly. snake or or, or, yeah. or whatever it is. But look at the art way the arm is mm. restricted, and you know, really, and yet the beautiful light on that, and the softness to it, mm. and the hard, slimy surface of the snake eel, whatever it is. It's just fantastic. I mean, simple. And look, man, look, even looking at it closer, the way that the the terrazzo, the floor is following the outline of her body. Yeah, and how that contrasts against. I mean, it looks her skin looks like slightly blurred as well. The lines yes. are. Yes. Definitely, she's Whereas moving. on the terrazzo flooring, it's very yeah. linear and angular. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, and they yeah. are cold and hard, aren't they, those floors? Oh, oh, yes, yes, the suffering of the artist. Okay, on to Joel Peter Whitkin. Now, I will give a little cap warning on these ones. These are quite shocking images. Um, so, but it's photography, it's constructed, there's nothing real going on here, but they are shocking. I'll just get, I'll just, I've got to say that, haven't I? I've got to give a little warning. To Joel Peter Witkin, again, another firm favour of my students. So, Joel Peter Witkin, a storyteller, another American storyteller. Um, 
I saw a quote that stuck in my mind. He's saying, I'm a happy man. And I think, OK, <laughs> thanks for telling us that. I think you, you would not get that from your photographs. He uses he he is used. He's interested in the macabre. He's, he uses cad cadavers, dead bodies. He uses dwarfs, midgets, people who would be seen as not part of ostracized that, of, from society. Mm. Uh, very with a very gothic view to it. Also, at the same time, painterly, it just doesn't look like a photograph. It looks more like a painting. And you see the way he's framed it um, and edged it, all completely constructed in his studio. So it's uh, it's uh, it's no, as I say, it's no, it's, there's no reality going on here. It's a vision. Gosh, I mean, that is pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Mm. It's modern. Is, is he still alive today? He's still working today. He's a modern photographer, even though they look very, very old. And he's obviously mm -hmm. trying to get the idea that gothic Victorian uh, sideshow type look to it, um, which is, I think it's achieved very well here. Mm -hmm. Wow, let's look at that. I mean, what is... It makes you wince, that one. It really does, doesn't it? Oh, me. Really, and the guy, he's, he's really chosen the subject. Well, the neck on that guy mm. is a, uh, mm. really unusual neck. He's got the skull cap on there. He's got this background that is, you know, from Renaissance painting, uh, brushed on there, hand-painted backgrounds. And then he's got a nail going through his nose to top it all off. Wow. Very, very odd. Uh Again, I, I, I'm sort of a little bit lost for explanations on this one. I'm, I've got to say, I'm, I've included. I'm not a massive fan. I'll be honest about that. I'm not, you know. But um, nevertheless, there is a process here going on of use the, using the camera as a tool, a cathartic tool. He wants, he's got, even though he says he's a happy man, there's something dark going on here. And he's getting it out there getting his feelings out there using the using the, the photography the medium of photography mm -hmm. so we got a date on this one 1987 so it looks it's it dateless isn't it you would never know looking at that mm -hmm. that is in the 1990s uh, this one the raft of w bush obviously 2006 um george w bush sorry george bush this is uh do, do, you, do you know the well this is a, this is a a uh, copy of a famous painting. I don't know. It called the Ship, Ship of Fools. I think it is. Do you know that painting? Mm -hmm. uh, not very well, but it does look familiar. The yeah. instruction here. Yeah, yeah, and it's got, yeah, so yeah. So I think this is obviously referencing that painting, the Ship of Fools, this idea of George Bush and his presidency, um, and all the things the Iraq War that went on under that, and all the things mm -hmm. you know that he did, that he did or didn't do. Um, yeah. Just a couple more left on him. Hopefully, they're not too shocking. But um, we got a bit. What's going on here? It's we got a bit of Picasso um, painting in the bottom right hand corner. We've got some cubist type um, motifs. We've got a dead baby in a bell jar. And what is this here? With this, it looks like the head mutilated. Mm -hmm. It's um, yeah, it's it's disturbing stuff. That's for sure. Okay, and I think this is the last one. Again, you can see he's referencing here the Man Ray, very famous Man Ray photograph uh, of the model sitting on a bed, and she looks like a cello or a double bass. Uh, quite a famous photograph. So he's obviously mm -hmm. referencing stuff and bringing it back to his interpretation of it. And instead of having her the F holes like on the original on the back mm. on man ray we've got here some really deep lacerations mm. and of course it, it's totally exaggerated pulling in the waist in a rather horrific way Fant yeah fantastic stuff really okay and the last one this is the last one of job peter Whitkin. well what can you say about that i love it the background is definitely you know is it's very it's, it's lots of lots of referencing going on here mm. And in some way, this is what I, why I'm not a massive fan of Joel with, with Peter Whitkin. Is even, it's not the shock value; it's the fact that I can. It's very easy to see where he's referencing. It's a quite, it's, it's, it's even though it's a, a menage or a put together piece, I can, under, I can see the influences quite easily. Yeah. 
Okay, on to um, Gregory Crutchen. Oh, I know all American chef. Oh, we do have some British photographers coming up. <laughs> coming up. Yeah, but Gregory Crutchen um, is a, again uh, is alive. He's still working today. And his his work uh, you would find in the gallery. It's definitely he's definitely he's the, of all the photographers here. He's the most successful, the most famous. Have you heard of him at all, Robin? I haven't. No. no, no it's um, I should I should caveat that by saying famous by in in the photography world, not in the normal world. But he's he's his work is created as I say for the gallery. I've been to the I've seen his work in the gallery, and it looks amazing. They're five foot canvases or prints on the wall. Um, referencing cinema and modern america uh, he, he uses casts or used your crew i should say of 30 to 40 people to make his photographs working on it like a film set in fact he doesn't even press the button on the camera yes that's somebody somebody for him <laughs> yeah it, but that it, it's because he's got a vision hmm. he, and he's in complete control of this vision and he, he, he and he, he just works in a different way to most photographers. His pieces of go go for they, roughly a half a million to a million dollars for one of his photographs. So he's very clever. Let's have a look. So I'm going to focus on the pictures here on the body of work he did called Twilight, and this is the front cover of the book, um, uh, and it's set in suburban America in this time of twilight the, just as it's getting when light turns to dark that rather bewitching time mm -hmm. when things strange things happen possibly or the surreal takes over or we see the world in a different lens so you can see here again just what love like the other photographers is referencing going on here he's referencing the pre Raphaelite painting of Felia, the very famous painting but Instead of a, an, on a lake in the middle of the countryside, here we are in a woman lying in a lake in a suburban American house. Mm -hmm. This is a set. They're all sets. They're not, there's nothing real going on here. Um, well, whatever real is. So it's completely constructed. Every item is placed. Every item is lit uh, in, in exactly how he would want it. Uh, and there's a question here. There's always a question of what is going on it's this idea about i don't know it's, it's t t t I, I, he's influenced by the film close encounters how do you know close encounters robin i do yes and there's also the twilight series isn't there a vampire yeah i think that would have come a bit later actually yeah mm. the twilight exactly yeah maybe they and I, he's very very referenced in uh music and album covers mm. and film. he's you know very well copied but the the I can read. I, I love that film, The Close Encounters. In fact, it's one of my favourite films. Uh, Sp Steven Spielberg, the second film, Jaws, and then he come out with Close Encounters. That's a pretty good uh, double blow there. And you can and Close and yeah, and Close Encounters for people who might not have seen it. If you haven't, I do recommend you dig it out. Is it's about UFOs? It's science fiction, but there's a real strange undercurrent of people being taken over by this um, zeitgeist, this I notion, what would you call it, Robin, this notion of um, connection in some ways. Yeah, and how we can communicate, how, how, how communication happens. Communication. Exactly, yeah, it's about these aliens coming down and communicating with us, other things. It's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant film. Anyhow, so here we are, suburban America, in the, I mean, what is going on here? You, you create your own narrative, that's the idea. As a photographer, Beautiful. I'm just blown away by the, his, the skill involved in creating an image like this. You know, it's um, it, a lot of there's a bit of composition, a bit uh, it, going on in Photoshop or digitally afterwards, a bit of manipulation, but mm. um, beautifully constructed. Wow. This one, I think, yeah, it's definitely you can see the uh, Close Encounters influence. Yeah. <laughs> definitely definitely and it is isn't it it's something it's the, it's it's something and it could be a normal scene but it's not a scene you see every, you know you, you you're used to seeing um and that's his vision and they are like scenes aren't they like scenes from a movie rather than definitely. a photograph definitely photograph. Def definitely and when you see these in the gallery i mean they're huge they're five foot by four foot and here you can see this guy is in his bathroom 
putting his hand down, I think, the plug hole of the shower. So there's a bit of a Hitchcock thing going on here, isn't there? Or ref, definitely reference for film noir. Um, you know, why is he putting his hand down? There's something there he's feeling. Maybe he's lost something down that plug hole and he's feeling for it. And who knows what's down there in the basement? Yeah, expecting the shark to come up now. And grab him. <laughs> And it's great, isn't it? And, it look, and you know, photography, it's really beautifully put together. Lots of lighting details in there, mm. colours, a mix, you know, the blue of the basement, the coldness of the basement, the more warmth of the bathroom with the pinks, etc., and the light where it's lit. What do you think of these? Do you like these, Robin? I do like these later series more than the earlier ones. The earlier ones, as I was saying, they're quite unsettling, but they do make you question things and, and make you think, and I like that. And yes. we've got somebody who's joined us now, Tammy, and yes. she's been saying how powerful the photographs are and the light, like in the first of the Twilight series, how the light caught the lady who was mm -hmm. floating mm -hmm. uh, and drew your attention immediately to her. Yeah. So, yeah, I love the, the use of light. I'm... I'm really into light and colour. Yes. So, yeah, I, I'm yeah. finding these quite intriguing. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Tom, uh, Tammy. Very, very incisive. Yeah, look, without photography, without light, there would be no photography. You know, photography mm. is the study of light, you know, mm. at its most basic, deepest level, really. And how it's used and you can play with it to yeah. create yeah. feelings and, yeah. and how I mean, you respond. I mean, I'm not, you know, God forbid I would work with my commercial clients creating these types of scenes. <laughs> but I do, no, I really draw in these influences. And I'm always, you know, in my mind trying to create these Gregory Cruton scenes in my commercial photography. They're very, very influential on me. Mm. Okay, and a couple, just a couple more of his again. Very beautifully lit very painterly and as i say in the gallery i remember seeing them in the white cube gallery which is in shoreditch i was about 15 years ago and the gallery was completely black and they had the special lighting on the that the uh mm. installed that was gave you a square light so the, the picture was square uh the light was square and then on the edge of the frame it went straight off into blackness so you were looking like a, a cinema screen a tv screen yeah yeah Gregory Crucian, and there's a little um, sort of behind the scenes of the mechanics of creating these images. Yeah, no, I show you, you know, look at all the lighting involved. Nothing is left to chance there. And the smoke machine, the crew on there. Oh, this is fantastic. The scrim. Oh, it's all it's a high tech stuff in there. But he, what, the way he works is he's, he's got, he has a concept. And then he he's got uh, uh, he's got an agent, and the agent will commission people, will put that concept out, I believe, and people will buy the photograph before it's created. That's how he manages to monetize it and basically create yeah. the amazing scenes. And the I love those one. behind the scenes; they're really great. Yeah, there's, there's, there is a film. Oh, what's it called now? Brief Encounters. That is a documentary that came out a few years ago. The Brief Encounters, a documentary about Gregory Creech and the way he works. And I have to say, uh, even though he's got like 30 or 40 people on these uh, crew, on this set creating these photographs, when he shows his early work, when he was studying at university, his photographs looked exactly the same. Not exactly the same, they looked very similar. So he had that aesthetic early on when he was working on his own. He just upscaled it. You, you can look at his early photographs from university and say, ah, oh, that's a Gregory Creason. I definitely get that. Another genius then to have that vision right yeah. from an early age. And I love when people kind of do something that's groundbreaking and different or from a completely different perspective. It might be a similar thing that somebody else has done before, but it's just from a 180 turnaround yes. and it makes you look at everything so differently. Yes, it really does. I mean, these people are very, very driven. I mean, you know, very, mm. very driven, very focused, pun, no pun, it, or pun intended. But yes, <laughs> yeah. another person I was going to say who obviously David Lynch is coming in here, isn't it? Mm. David Lynch, isn't it? Yeah, definitely that, uh, that, that fight feel to it. Okay, in British photographer, contemporary Tris Morrissey. Um, this is, this is great. I love what Trish Morrissey does. There's definitely humour in there. There's definitely, uh, it's all about her. It's, it's all about herself. It's about her family. It's about social interactions. It's about, it's about 
the photograph as a document um, and, the, and the family snapshot, I think I, that's fair to say. So what Chris Morrissey has done is she has taken family snapshots from the 1970s when she was growing up and re-photographed them in exactly the same, but with her taking the roles of different members of the family. So there she is dressed up in as her brother, I think it is, with the jeans, blue jeans, lounging back there. So she's copying a pose of her brother in this family snapshot, taken some th 20 years later. Okay, you know, that's Trish Morrissey. That's what she does. She plays, she plays with uh, this idea of the snapshot. There's a lot of, there's quite a movement of uh, people taking photographs many years later, say decades yeah. later. So children as adults, but doing the same things they were doing in the original photograph. Exactly. Trish Morrissey started this. I would argue that Trish Morrissey started this. Yeah, definitely. You're quite right. And, you know, when she, when the photographs are shown, you see the original photograph by it as well. And they are identical. It's fantastic. There's a definitely, uh, you know, there's a lot of fun going on here. Of course, a serious, there's a, it's a statement, but mm -hmm. they are good fun. <laughs> That is very funny, and having to find the clothes and everything I to I know. recreate the era. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it, you know, as a photographer, I can look at it and say, "Oh, it looks like a modern camera." It, you can see that, but even show the styling, the posing. Look how miserable <laughs> she looks. Yeah, exactly, it's brilliant. The pose, the hands, the yeah, so, so the facial, <laughs> yeah, the facial expression, the body language, yeah. everything that she's everything. recreating. I think she's fantastic. I think she's absolutely fantastic, you know. And again, they are photographic. You know, she's got a very minimal photo palette here. You know, similar colours. You know, it's all it all blends together. You know, she's so obviously chosen her original material carefully. Mm. What is that? Right at feet? Oh, it's a rabbit. Oh, it's a rabbit. I wonder what that was. A rabbit. Brilliant twist, obviously. Um, and this series of work, I think, was photographed in Australia. Australia, and. What she would do, she'd see families on the beaches and she'd go to the, the mother of the family and ask to take over her role. So she basically, Trish Morrissey, Morrissey would become the mother of the family, sitting exactly where she was. And then the actual real mother of the family would then take the photograph. Yeah. So she would set the camera up. It's all done on a big 5-4 camera, which is you know, a, an old fashioned type camera with bellows. So quite intimidating for a start, but she set the camera up and then she go to the mother. Okay, can I swap over with you and hold the paper, sit in your chair and the, the family would all pose around it like another family photograph. Wow. And what these people must have thought, I don't <laughs> yeah. know. I don't know, but obviously they were game for it. They're compliant, mm. and, you know, it's, it's certainly a, a unique viewpoint. Well, I, I, I just said these were Australian, didn't I? And I'm looking at it, that's not Australia, is it? That's Beach. Is that Beachy Head? Well, it's the White Cliffs of Dover, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's what I've, I've, I've read that these were filmed in Australia. Obviously not, no. Okay, we've got a couple more of these. Yeah, and you can just about make her out in the background there. Um, I love this idea. It's, it's playing this whole idea of the snapshot and family history. And I'm sure it's, and it goes a lot deeper than that. And there's a sense of fly on the wall of, yes. I'm just going to step in to your yes. gathering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly, you know, we're just going to sit here, so everything's normal, but ex <laughs> except this work is now going to be featured in a gallery, in a magazine, in a book, or whatever it's going to be, and it's going to be immortalised forever. It's quite And quite people who, who know the family will go, yes, I know them, and them. oh, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> hey, what's she doing here and there? I know everybody else, but who's that? Yeah, I know. So strange. So strange. So brilliantly strange. OK, uh, I think this is the last one. Joe Spence, British photographer, um, uh, a feminist, right, a, a, a very prodigious writer on um, the women's role in society. 1990s, we're looking at here. And, and this particular photography piece is documenting her uh, dealing with um, a breast cancer and having a mastectomy. Um, so this is photography as a mirror, I would say, and it, it, it speaks for itself, isn't it? Very simple, very direct, very straight to the camera. 
I, I don't think I need to say too much about that, really. I'm, I'm struggling with words in this case. Obviously, I'm going to leave up to the viewer or the, to, and to, to work out what is going on here. But this, look, what we've got, we've got baby food. She's dressed up as a baby and she's feeding herself with food all over her, herself, going from happy to sad to looking almost like she's going to throw up there. Mm, this is not nice. Horrible baby food. Horrible baby food. Property of Joe Spence. Mm. With a question mark. Question mark. Very, very strong. Very, very strong. And of course, these would all be these photographs were were to be shown in contact in with words, uh, you know, in context. And there's a whole body a body of thought going on behind behind this. Um, again, this is definitely dealing with women's role in society, the patriarchal mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the housewife on the left, the mother on the right, and the mixing of those two boundaries. Um, if you want to find out more about Joe Spence, it's a great site that I discovered. Mm -hmm. um, photography and as an effective form of therapy by Joe Spence and Elephant Arts, a great website, and they do a really interesting piece where they talk about her work and she contributes to that. Hmm. Okay, last one, it's me. Yay. <laughs> but I thought, okay, what can I show? I thought I was, I, I, what, what I love doing is I like going for a walk in the country, you know, getting away from my hustle bustle of what I normally do, which is working with light and working with people and big productions and all that. There's nothing more I like doing for a walk in the country, my from the edge up in Bristol with my camera and a macro lens attached to my camera. A macro lens is great for doing close-ups of things. Hmm. So I find it a very meditative state to go in, look around, but look, not look everywhere, just look at one small detail, looking at hmm. details. Um, and what I do is I take my macro lens and I photograph oh. things. In, in a small, it's very a small mindful. Small. Mm -hmm. mindful exactly this is my mindfulness you know i either pick up my guitar and play oh that sounds like a song or um i go in with my macro lens and i look at just little things little details that catch my eye and spend maybe minutes if not hours just looking at things um that's incredible that photograph and i that's a combination in nature of color that always kind of i think we would probably be told those are colors that you wouldn't put together and yet nature does nature puts these colors together and oh, yeah. yeah it's stunning purple and yellow or magenta, mm. magenta. Mm. I, I know it's not an incredible combination and you see that color i've got a few photographs speaking this color yeah. yeah it's a great combo isn't it it's a great mm. combo would you wear would you wear purple and yellow together uh no <laughs> <laughs> So would I. And I love purple. I love yellow. But I would not wear both together. That's quite a bold statement. Anyhow, here's me with me. You can, if you've got a camera phone, uh, most people have, they have a great facility about doing this macro type of photography, doing things close up. They're great at doing this. Okay, this is done on an expensive camera and lens. But you can do this very similar with your camera phone. And it's just a question of looking at your feet. You don't need to go far. That's the point on this. You don't need to go far. It's all there around us. Okay, and yeah, I mean, oh, anyway. Yeah, those are one of my favorite flowers. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? This is all taken in autumn. These were taken in, I think, mm -hmm. October of last year. Yeah. And it's and it was about the last pieces, you know, last bit of color before the winter comes. But this is it. Yeah, you're this is are they beautiful? Isn't it exquisite? And the way you've made it that you can see some of the little individual flowers mm. so clearly and i just think they're so beautiful i love the color of them i love the smell because that this have a they have a beautiful scent these flowers thank you yeah but yeah and then how it fades into out a of focus blur. in a bit of blurness we look like a bit of blur a bit of blurriness <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> yeah again it's that color again that i mean it's, it's, mm. It is the same flower, but it's a different flower, I think. But yeah, the colour, the painterliness of it. Yeah, bit of meditation. Yeah, oh, nice. beautiful! That nice. those some flowers of the those deeper colours—they're so velvet, aren't they? 
And yeah. that you can, it's really, I just want to touch it. It's really tactile. It's very tactile, isn't it? And I've sort of accented it with the light. I've chosen mm -hmm. the photograph of this in um, and the folk de depth of field. But they've become richer. The colours become richer as the flower dies, yes. doesn't it? Because it's mm. obviously dehydrating and I guess it's more, it just gets richer. I like, I, you know, it, they, yeah. And a couple of other ones, maybe not so good or successful. Oh, no, I love that. Thank you. Because mosses are, are so oh. textural, aren't they? And again, yes. you just want to stroke your fingers down that and feel. Yeah, I, I, I've tried growing mosses in my garden and I love mosses, but I find them very hard to grow. This is the thing, nature just does it so naturally, doesn't she? And yes. in places yes. that you think, well, I should be able to recreate that. And then you try and it doesn't always have the same impact. The no, same impact. exactly. Uh, and the, um, this is my last. Of my oh, mm, beautiful. That's just light, you know, that's just capturing yeah. a little bit shaft of light on that uh, with the background in shadow. There's no post-production on this is exactly as you see it in camera a little bit of exposure tweaking for sure a little bit of tweaking of the exposure with the manual settings but you can do this this can be done on your camera phone That's camera, it. Phones, okay. camera phones are so amazing aren't they as to the things that you can do and the images that you can create i've done some stuff just with my phone uh and i don't know anything about the settings or how to change them or get the focus so that it, you can make it focus on the thing rather than just being its autofocus. But it. with dandelions and dandelion seed heads when they catch the light, similar to the last yes. one. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's why I love the camera phone because you, you, you can just press, it's going to, it works it out for you in, in, and it yeah. works out very well. Yeah, they do. And so you can just, all you, we haven't got to think about the technique or that. All you've got to think about is looking and observing looking yes. at the light and observing what you're photographing and de you know really looking at it closely did you have you been watching what well, oh god I'm going to talk too much have you been watching the uh, the green planet at all i have yeah i love all of those nature the, the photography and when they do the bit at the end yes. i'm um not sure if there's in the green planet at the end but often these nature programs where they talk about how they made it yes they do and that. you get to see because you, you sometimes, or I certainly do, get very frustrated that I try to take photographs like that. And then I see the hours that it goes into making them and all the setup that they do. And and the well, people, obviously, that, they, they've been doing this for years. Yeah, yeah, they've been doing this for years. Particularly, I love the time-lapse stuff that yeah. they do. Yeah, yeah. It's just well, mind-blowing. It is. They talked about it in the first episode of the series and they showed the camera that some guy had invented. And basically the whole series, the whole is all based around this technique of this camera that can move and take photographs at the same time over a long period of time. No, it's very, very good. And it's amazing. The plants, yet again, they they they, they are amazing. Amazing. We all know not wildlife, furry things, scary things, but plants, wow, what a story they tell. But it's like the pho the photographs that you've just shown us. When you go in close and you see the detail, you see the detail of a moss or of the the first flower because there were the petals, and we quite often focus on the petals. But when you look at the center, that was all separate little flowers. Yeah, totally. and it's wow. Yeah, the the different scales in that, and yeah, nature just blows my mind. Yeah, it's it, it's uh, well, and you know. It's not just out in the countryside as well, Robin, is it? It's, it's everywhere. It's, nature's everywhere, you know. Uh, in fact, that last episode of The uh, the Green Planet was all about weeds, wasn't it? And their pervasiveness, how they can grow in the urban jungle and, or whatever, you know. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen the, the latest one yet, but I um, followed Miranda on Instagram for a while, and she was doing that where I think she lives in London, you know, mm -hmm. Miranda Hart, the comedian. Uh, ah, okay. And she was... Yes. She talks about mental well-being and how she supports her own it's going out and seeing, looking for beauty. Uh, this is the particular section of the Instagram account that I saw. And she was just going out and finding what we might call a weed. So like a dandelion or whatever. And that flower that I said I really love, the Verbena bonariensis. Oh. That they, they grow they grow on uh, wasteland quite often and buddleia as well 
quite often you'll see them down the sides of uh, railway tracks and things. So it's just waste land, but they're beautiful. And the scent of them is incredible because the buddleia is the butterfly bush and bees and everything is very, really attracted to the uh, nectar that they produce. So you don't have to go out into the countryside. You don't even have to go to a park. You can just walk down the street and you will find lots, particularly at this time of the year, because things are starting to grow again. You'll find lots of bits of nature that you can do that close up photography with and just be blown away. Yeah, definitely, 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 definitely. So there we go. A, a photographer, you know, that's photography sort of mindfulness in some ways the slides i've been showing um, in, in some sort of way in a, in a loose way I, I i appreciate but yeah hopefully hopefully you and your viewers have enjoyed seeing some maybe photographers that you wouldn't normally go and see or seek out and i think it's inspiring isn't it because if you're not somebody who often looks at photography and i wouldn't be somebody who often looks at art kind of photography i would look maybe at the more nature because mm -hmm. that's just who i am but to see those things and and to have that even ooh, that's unsettling and i'm not quite sure what they're trying to say with that photograph but what does it do for me well, you know what response does it bring up in me and and then moving on to the the later ones that you took yourself and uh, tammy has come on and she said i never know how my photographs of heidi that's her baby will come out uh, so she's saying it can take hours to capture what she's trying to get in the photo mm -hmm. uh, and heidi has just had her first tooth breakthrough <laughs> but she hasn't managed to get a clear photograph of that one yet okay keep trying <laughs> This, you, you, you got a two smile. There. Yeah, well, you got a perfect subject there, somebody with you all the time. Rinse and repeat, yes. rinse and repeat. <laughs> and Heidi is one of the most photographic babies you've ever seen. And Heidi is very good at taking photographs of her and does those fantastic ones like we'll have a Christmas shoot and we'll have, she did a fantastic one at um, Halloween where she'd hollowed out a pumpkin and put yeah. Heidi, because Heidi was a good bit smaller then, put Heidi so she was sitting in the pumpkin and just looking out of the, the over the edge but yeah Heidi's very good at, at framing that you were talking about you know getting the the uh, subjects in the photograph just looking perfect whereas I've seen a series of photographs where you might have all the ones that are done professionally of the baby you know the baby that is in the father's hand sort of photograph oh yes and right. the family is trying to recreate that at home and it just yeah. it's not the same but Heidi manages to do them just as if they were a studio shoot lovely is, 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 is Heidi a photographer? Oh, sorry, uh, Tammy. Tammy Tammy is Tammy a photographer? she's considering uh, oh. oh and she's also said that <laughs> <laughs> Heidi has learned how to stick her tongue out, which makes it even more difficult to take a photograph of the two. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's that. Yeah. Um, Tammy is a very, very creative friend of mine. Um, and she's, as I was saying, very good at photography. So she's been considering branching out into that, but wondering whether that's the direction in which to go. Oh, well, look, please, you, you pass on my details. Let's have a chat about it. Yeah, I love to. I love to try and persuade you to come to, to enter the dark arts. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Tammy, an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> so thank you so much, Marcus, for sharing that really interesting journey through photography and uh, seeing all the different ways then that it, we can use it to benefit our own well-being if we're using it for mindfulness or just to go to a gallery and to mm. maybe look at the world through a different lens. Mm, nice. I like what you did there. <laughs> so thank you, Marcus. Thank you. And uh, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and weekend and to everyone else as well. And keep a, an eye out in the group. I'll be sharing some of my following guests who will be coming up probably every two weeks or so now uh, in the group. I'm going to have some amazing people with some great stories to, to share. So see you then. Bye for now.